everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, this is our second engineering management seminar. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carlo Siliberti. Dr. Siliberti holds a bachelor's in biomedical engineering uh, from Temple, a master's in electrical engineering from Widener, and a master's and PhD in engineering management from Drexel. Um, his focus of research is entrepreneurship, and that's um, what he's going to talk about today, his work and experience with entrepreneurship. He's currently a uh, senior manager of automation and engineering at Johnson & Johnson. Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So before I start, I'd like to announce we have a prestigious guest with us today, a recent recipient of the Outstanding Teacher Award. Yes. So I'd like to congratulate Dr. Joseph Martin, uh, who's also my mentor throughout the process and uh, all around nice guy. So congratulations. <laughs> well done. So thank you, um, really, for the introduction. Thank you so much. So the first question is usually asked um, with entrepreneurship. It's something that um, I'm very passionate about. But inevitably, the first question is, Entrepreneur, intrapreneur, like what's the difference? So from a definition standpoint from Merriam-Webster, entrepreneur, I think everybody knows, is someone who organizes, manages, and assumes the risk of business and enterprise. The big uh, emphasis here is willing to risk the loss. So the emphasis is on the individual when they go out and start a new business or a new venture. An entrepreneur, on the other hand, is someone who also has the drive, the capabilities, the passion to start a new venture, but they do it under the corporate umbrella. So they want to do it under uh, some variation of what they're familiar with. They want to use the corporate assets, but they still have ideas to further uh, the company or the corporation. So why entrepreneurship in the first place? In a comprehensive study of more than 6 million firms, Stubert and Knight noted that only a tiny fraction of the firms uh, lived to age 40, which I thought was incredible. The average life expectancy of a large firm is between a little under six years to about 14 and a half years. And that, that was intriguing to me because you take, especially a large firm, you have all the experience finance, all the different core competencies, the strategic assets, how come they're not more successful? And then you have the, the subset of firms that make it past 40. What differentiates them from the other firms? What do they do differently? And I, I believe from the research that the difference does point to entrepreneurship and the ability to explore and capitalize on new ventures that are aligned within the corporation. And I think that's, that's very important. You have to be aligned to the company's core competencies so there's some familiarity. And inevitably, corporations experiencing diminishing traditional markets have to reposition themselves to develop new markets to stay competitive. And the forward-thinking corporations will rely on internal entrepreneurial efforts or entrepreneurship to alter an organization's, organization's status quo harness the energy of the talent they have in-house, and give sponsorship to new, business, new businesses within the corporation. So for corporate prosperity, um, technology-based industrial firms with production assets usually foster a culture of continuous new product improvement and development. So before I was um, with Johnson & Johnson, I worked for Lockheed Martin for a little under 15 years. Lockheed Martin was, you know, as many people are aware, they specialize in Department of Defense contracts. They're big with Aegis. I worked in Morristown, New Jersey, which is central on radar. So they're constantly trying to develop new ways to enhance their radar. They went from ship-based radar to um, what's called Aegis Assure, which is a, a shore-based capability, but using the same concepts. And in times where uh, Department of Defense contracts become questionable with new administration, um, more peaceful policies, what's a, a large company that's focused on defense? What are they, 
you know, what can they do to stay competitive, to keep their employees, and keep going forward? You know, they answer to stockholders just like any other company. And what what Lockheed did was they had a new venture white space area where they would take ideas from engineers and they would look at them and they would see if they could develop into um, formable variations. With their history there, there was several impediments that I'll get into in a little bit, but the big emphasis was if it, if it can relate to the core competencies within the business, usually they're successful. But there has to be a little bit of a mindset shift from what they're used to to branch out and have the new venture come under the, the corporate umbrella. So what are some of the roadblocks? Some of the roadblocks to entrepreneurship is you can't always do new things the way you've done old things in the past. Um, it's very easy to, to become arrogant when you're very successful and dismiss new ideas because that's not the way we've done things in the past and we've always been successful. Um, a good example of that is, you know, when, uh, with the Department of Defense, there's government regulations, there's all kinds of checks and balances which are necessary with Department of Defense contracts because the emphasis is on reliability and sustainability. Taking that model and going competitive against a mom and pop organization is not going to work too well. You're not going to be able to go to market as fast as your competitor. So the, the culture has to change to encompass the new ideas and the new path forward. Another um, detriment is a lot of focus is on short-term results. What's the quarterly profits? How does it affect the stock market? How do we answer to our stockholders? Um, it's very difficult to keep funding ideas for the future that may not be able to come to fruition in the near future and may take years to develop. That is a, is a detriment in, in large corporations. So the entrepreneurship process, um, throughout my research, there's a, I developed a process that can be used as a guide for both the entrepreneurs and the corporations to take an idea from its conception and develop it so it can be presented to senior leadership for approval to see if we want to go to a, a new venture within the corporation. Um, the process was developed through a lot of research with um, new ventures that have failed. Uh, a lot of times learning from failures, there's a lot more to learn from a failure than a success, um, but also research on successful new ventures um, and just general observations from past experiences. Throughout the, the entrepreneurship process, the, the key asset to making the process successful are mid-level engineers who have both the technical and management savvy, which means they understand the relationship between a corporation's success and their own success. Um, they're not going to, the engineer's not going to be successful and be able to advance and have more responsibility if the corporation's going under. That understanding is very important, and um, a lot of mid level engineers do understand that, which makes engineers a, a, a great prospect for entrepreneurship. So, learning from past failures, there, there's many, many instances of a, of a past failure. Um, for this uh, discussion, I'm just going to focus on one. Uh, I'd like to pick Boeing. Uh, Boeing, if you're familiar with recent events, their stock has skyrocketed over the last year. Um, it, it's escalated at an incredible pace. It wasn't always that way. Uh, Boeing was a very focused aerospace firm. They were very big with fighter jets, especially coming out of the, the 1970s, 60s, 70s with the Vietnam War. And that's the timeline I like to focus on. 
when the Vietnam War started um, ramping down and we went from a more um, wartime stance to a peaceful stance, the uh, Department of Defense contracts started to dry up. So there wasn't as much money going into the Department of Defense um, as during the war. Boeing was very successful during that time. They wanted to maintain that success. They wanted to maintain their profits, uh, maintain their employees, and keep going forward. So one of the ideas they had was uh, they were going to venture into white space or new ventures. Um, and how, how could they do that? So they did develop um, an Office of Corporate Business Development. And the, one of the first new ventures that they took on was light rail transportation, or LRDs. And this was uh, championed by their Boeing Virtual Division in 1973. And they were awarded a contract to build a standardized light rail vehicle. Long story short, um, there was a lot of design flaws. The trains were problematic for the very first days. The, the, the transit authority hated them. Um, there was a lot of failures. Anytime the, the rail cars went over a, a sharp or a, a sharp curve, they would derail. There was problems, electrical problems with their motors. Um, the door system was overly complicated, so the doors would get stuck and passengers would have to exit through emergency egress. Um, all in all, it was, it, it was a complete and utter, utter failure. So, you know, looking at this, why did it fail? Certainly, Boeing engineers had the capability to produce rail cars. Um, they had the technology. They could make supersonic planes. What happened? Um, factors that added to the failure was improper planning to diversify into an unfamiliar market, economic pressure, the, the pressure was to keep going with their profitability and maintain that pace of the, the Vietnam era, ignoring lessons learned from the past and historical um, aspects to the, to the rail car designs, using unproven technology and failure to thoroughly test. Given all those factors, though, the, the main reason, in, in my opinion, of their failure was the lack of leadership that understood the details and relationships of that specific new venture. Um, the, the mindset was still, you know, we're, we're Boeing, we know what we're doing, we'll just use the model that's made us successful in the past, and we'll just apply it to this and everything should be fine and we'll be as successful as we were with, with fighter jets. So with that mindset, they did rely on their core competencies, but they used their past aerospace and aeronautic engineering practice to design the LRPs. They didn't do their due diligence and research into uh, the mass transit, into their um, intricacies and nuances of the LRVs. Uh, they just kind of forged ahead. And one of the examples of this is the, is the rail car doors, which really in the, in the late 70s was a focal <coughs> point from the Mass Transit Association. Um, the, the actual doors were designed out of the same materials as the supersonic um, fighter planes. So in essence, the, the doors could withstand supersonic flight, but they couldn't open and close at every stop without failing. So they, they, couldn't, they couldn't stand up to the daily kicks and shoves from passengers trying to exit quickly, and, and that was their downfall. Um, that, that arrogance, if you will, of ignoring lessons learned and trying to open minds and understanding a different niche and Focusing on what worked in the past is proof that you know this this can't work using the same um, format and the same goals as we had for for aerospace. So, with that, you know there there's numerous new ventures that have been successful, and what made them successful. So we, we take some examples from failures, some from successes and, and go forward. Um, for this, again, for this discussion, the one I picked was IBM. Um, 
IBM's been in business for over 75 years. They were hugely successful. They passed the 40-year mark, um, and you know their reputation of being an industry leader was was always stellar. Um, the difference between success and failure, though, with with IBM again points to entrepreneurship, and I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail with that. This is a, a brief history of IBM. They started in 1924. Um, they were, you know, big with uh, corporate computers, uh, big with uh, Department of Defense servers, new languages like Fortran was a development of IBM. Um, they introduced like the floppy disk in the early 70s. The, you know, they were always innovating um, areas related to computers, and that was their, that was their niche. They were also, when I did the research, I didn't know this, but um, IBM was responsible for the ATMs, for the for the, the cash coming out of the machines at the banks. I didn't, I didn't know IBM was, was associated with that, but they developed that as well. So they had all their core competencies was pushed towards computers and, and development. But then what happened in the, in the 90s, everything started to slide down when the history of the world went to personal computers, IBM didn't keep up with that. And again, it was a little bit of arrogance that you're not looking at the way the times are changing and embracing those changing times. You're looking at what was done previously and how can we just maintain that path forward and, and just keep going that way and everything will be the same as it was. So with that, in the, in the early 90s, IBM reached their first uh, downfall. They lost $8 billion. Um, they lost half of their employees. They went from a staff of 400,000 to 200,000, and they were heading to, heading to bankruptcy. They were, they were doing terrible. In 2000, they developed um, an entrepreneurship team within IBM to start looking at different ideas. Um, they recognized that there was a culture shift throughout IBM's history. Their CEOs were always um, promoted from within, so they, they kept the culture of IBM very close-knit. Um, and they, again, they maintained their, their culture, was known white shirt, specific ties, Everybody dressed the same, everybody looked the same, and that was their culture to go forward. So in 93, in the, in the peak of the downward slide for IBM, uh, Louis uh, Gershner became the CEO, and he was the first CEO of IBM to come from outside the company. So he came on board, and the, the press like, ridiculed him immediately it looked like he wasn't doing anything. The, the slide continued, and he really took his time to observe what was going on. He was from outside the company, and his, his first job was to, in his mind, was to look and see what's going on, look, absorb the culture, and see where he can make the best improvements. So after several months, he came, came out with a... Um, a uh, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. He, he talked to the press about you know, what his um, assessment was, excuse me, of IBM. And what he said was, we've got to become more nimble, entrepreneurial, focused, cost-driven, and we've been too bureaucratic and preoccupied with our own view of the world. IBM needs a strategic and cultural change. So he recognized through his various contacts within IBM when he took over that they were just out of touch with culture and with what was happening outside of IBM. And he needed to focus the group, all of IBM, back into what was really happening and the advancements happening within the world. So in the year 2000, he developed the Emerging Business Opportunities Team, and it was explicitly formed to address IBM's chronic failure 
to rapidly and successfully pursue new market opportunities. Previously, they were always a day late and a dollar short. By the time they went through all their bureaucratic gates to put forth a new idea, it was already being developed. They were constantly missing the boat. So what they did is they, they, they ramped down, they stripped down the bureaucracy, and they developed an integrated set of processes, incentives, and structure designed to enable IBM employees to address new business opportunities. So they focused on the white space, and with that new group, they became more profitable, and their goal was if they have an idea, they were going to pursue it with the notion that it could become a billion-dollar business within five to seven years. That was their goal, and that was their, that's what the, the bar was for any of their new ventures. So the, the business opportunities group became viewed as a group of little startup companies within IBM that developed and nurtured inside the management constructs of the industry's largest information technology company. In essence, they became entrepreneurs within their own company. So this is a graphic of the process that I developed. And again, this is to be used for uh, people with ideas and the corporation. Uh, there's a series of gates that new ideas can be granted permission to proceed or denied at any time. Um, but I'd like to, to walk through these steps with you and use an example of a, of a new venture. So a lot of, between looking at the successes and failures of new ventures, what were some of the common uh, denominators for, for being successful? And it comes down to uh, what's listed as forgetting borrowing, and learning. The new business venture really has to forget how the existing core business was successful because, again, what made the core business successful may not be applicable to the new venture. So that's really got to go out the window. You can't do new things the way you've done old things and expect it to be successful in the new venture. However, Again, the difference between entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is you can borrow some of the core business assets. And that's the greatest advantage between entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. You have that corporate umbrella, that protection. Um, you know, financial, um, usually there's uh, subject matter experts in different areas that you can go to for consultations. All that is within that corporate umbrella that you would not have as an entrepreneur going out on your own. Uh, even you know, the startup cash um, is, is a huge burden because if, you know, an entrepreneur, you're worried about every dollar. If you have that corporate umbrella that you can fall back on and they have funds dedicated to white space, that's a huge relief of not having to worry about that on a day-to-day -day basis as well as developing the idea into something formidable. And the learning aspect, you have to be prepared. The new venture has to be prepared to learn from scratch. Um, you have to change the behavior. It's going to be difficult. You're, even the subject matter experts from within the corporation that come in to help, they're used to doing things a certain way. There has to be an open mindset that this is something new, and we have to look at this as a, as a completely new venture, but within the, the corporate um, confines. And, and that in my opinion, from past experiences, has been the most difficult. The fallback when times are tough, when you know, people get tired, um, the challenges come out, the fallback has always been, let's use some of our old procedures, and that's what we know. Um, again, going back to, to my experience with, with Lockheed, we went into um, renewable energy uh, white space. So we were developing um, a biomass plant in, um, it was a Wego, New York, and it was a 
biomass to, to energy, making biogas run in an internal combustion engine, and being very competitive so we could sell that to, to um, the mass market from a business perspective. Every time there was a critical roadblock, Technology wasn't working just right. We had to do additional testing, more experimentation, whatever the case would be. The fallback from senior leadership down was always the fallback on the Department of Defense procedures and policies. And all that did was create additional people coming on board that weren't providing the necessary skill sets to advance the technology. It was more bureaucratic uh, to answer to, to different VPs, different senior leaders, and it just escalated the cost. And that always had to be, the path would, the ship would be steering that direction. There always had to be a course correction to keep it in the new venture mentality, not do what always worked for a Department of Defense policy. This, this isn't DOD, this is commercial business, and that has to constantly be at the forefront of everybody's mind. So, for example, walking through the process, um, I'd like to take a look at an idea we're using uh, renewable energy. So, we're going to take an idea, a group of individuals, they're working on, they're working on a new venture, a new white space and they say, you know, I have a, I have a great idea um, how we could help uh, the electric grid. Um, it's overburdened. Uh, I think we should head into renewable energy. It's a sustainable source. What can we do to, to make that happen? So how do we narrow that down to, into something that we could present to, to senior leadership? I can't just say, you know, I want to, I want to go into renewable energy. It, it's got to be focused. It's got to be well thought out. There's a lot of work that has to be involved to, it, for the presentation. So let's start out where, where we think it's um, needed the most and we have the, the most resources where we can make a strong business case. So in this example, we're going to use the Northern High Plains, which has a, a rich source of, of wind power. So if you look at it, like satellite pictures, you can see all these acres. Um, right now they're being used for dairy, oil seeds, crops. Um, power is being supplied locally by rural electric associations. Um, and right now they're only supplying the power out in the, in the Midwest by using coal. So what can we do to make that more sustainable and more renewable, better for the environment? So we'll also look at dairy farms. Um, they're really out in the Great Plains. They're comparable to large corporations due to the, the mass of how many cows they have. A lot of the farms are a thousand plus dairy cows. Um, which is, you know, in contrast to what we're used to. If you go out to Lancaster, and you see some small farms. These are these are huge out there. So we're going to take a an entrepreneurial proposal. We're going to take the basic idea, and we're going to describe it using integrated rural renewables um, from a facility and operating entity, and that's that's going to be our example. So we're going to look at um, the technical, organizational, managerial, financial issues, any, uh, anticipate any questions that a senior leadership or anybody um, who's going to be providing the funding, any questions they might have. We want to be well prepared when we do our presentation to make sure, you know, we've, we've looked at details, we've dotted our I's, we've crossed our T's, we're going to make a very strong business case. So in this example, what, what can we do aside from providing power to local sources? What else can we do to enhance this for, from a profitability? So in this example, we're going to look at providing electricity, but also producing bio, biogas uh, for power production and local heating. 
using the biogas, um, it may be possible to use the excess power for either profit, storage, or um, heat for, you know, out in the, in the Great Plains when it gets cold, we may be able to use that for, for additional source of heat. So the first few steps of our, our corporate decision gates is, is the idea strategically aligned with the corporate ob objectives? Because this is going to be specific for each entrepreneur and each corporation because they're going to have their own set of criteria. But for this example, we're going to say, yes, the, the corporation is making an effort to go green. And they want to expand in the renewable energy market. So the first gate, we're going to be successful in passing. The next gate does the idea of the potential to expand the corporate portfolio. In this case, yes, if we want to be a market leader in renewable energy, we could greatly expand the portfolio. Could the idea result in the corporation becoming a market leader? Absolutely. We have the, the resources, we have systems engineers, um, we've integrated many solutions with similar concepts in, in the past, we've been very successful. And could the idea result in substantial sustained profits? And again, this is specific to the corporation, but in this particular instance, yes, we believe that full services can be offered for each solution and be hugely successful in the future. So that's our four decision gates that each ID would have to go through. So by passing all the corporate decision gates, the ID is acknowledged by senior leadership and the corporation as being potentially viable. And with that, an analysis team can be officially formed to study the ID in greater detail. So we now have permission from leadership. We think it's a great idea from what you presented. Go ahead and do your due diligence. They agree on a time frame, staff, and they go, go forth and, and do the initial research. The research is very critical to the success of the presentation and for the, the possible new venture. So the feasibility studies are going to encompass variables, factors, and potential benefits to determine if the investment of the corporate resources will yield a desirable result. With our example today, the first analysis involves providing sustainable renewable energy to the rural agricultural districts. The area studies the Great Plains, and we're going to first look at all the natural resources available. So the first one is wind energy. The windiest spots in the United States are off the coast, in the mountains, and straight down the Great Plains. Um, so from a, a wind energy perspective, uh, the Great Plains are great, and in fact, the top eight states of the most wind power are within the Great, uh, Great Plains. Excuse me. Ecology and environment. So the Great Plains stretch across 10 states. Uh, there's a, the map, the dark mustard areas the, is the Great Plains. There's 376 counties, about a half a million square miles of land and only about 3% of the country's population. So it's very sparse, very open. Some of what's produced in the Great Plains is a little over 300 million annual tons of wheat, oats, barley, a lot of agriculture, produce approximately a quarter of the world's total production of grains. And they're also the leader in the following feedstocks um, from vegetative animal, algae, and woody biomass. So we're going to, during this feasibility study, we're going to deep dive into, into what that means, gather some data, because in, inevitably there's going to be some questions about the specific biomass. And we're going to look to see, of what we study, what is the most viable solution to, to proceed with this new venture. So first we'll look at the, the vegetative feedstock. So we'll look at corn and wheat. When, um, when there's a harvest, the residues such as the wheat straw or the corn stover are left in the field. 
really only a fraction of that can be used since a lot of that, the waste is used to replenish the soil and keep the soil from eroding. So there's a percentage that could be used for, for waste energy. Um, looking at the potential energy benefits from the corn and wheat, the corn stover contains a little over uh, 5,000 BTU per pounds wet or a little over 7,000 dry. Um, wheat is a little bit less energy dense than corn. And there's also more tons of corn that can be collected per acre uh, than wheat straw. So this is gonna go into our, our feasibility study. Then the cost to collect the waste, uh, we have to analyze that uh, through research. It costs about 20 to $40 a ton for wheat. Um, I'm sorry, for, for corn, and about $50 a ton for wheat. So that's going to feed into our financial model. In addition to the, the corn and the wheat, let's look at energy crops. Um, switchgrass is a dominant plant in the Great Plains. Any types of marginal lands that are not specifically used for agriculture, we could use for an energy crop. So. Again, if we, if we cultivate and we harvest um, switchgrass, what, what would it take? What are the finances? What's the energy we can get from that switchgrass? So in the energy content, we have um, values for the amount of energy per pound and the cost for, for production. Same with proceeding with oil seed. We want to look at all the different um, vegetative feedstocks within the Great Plains. This will help us form a comprehensive decision. Uh, Transesterification is a process where uh, convert uh, feedstocks to biodiesel. Um, the net energy from, from using transesterification, it yields three times more of the energy in combustion than it takes to produce it, so it's very economical in um, as a, as a uh, renewable energy so we looked at we looked at the vegetation in the Great Plains we have a, a number of different aspects and data points that we can use to make our our decisions um, next we'll go for from vegetation to animal what's our animal feedstock uh, with the dairy forms there's a lot of areas where manure is collected, um, the cows are confi confined, and also on the feeding sites. And number-wise, um, a 1,500 pound cow produces about 125 pounds of manure daily, which now I understand why there's less population out there. Um, so there, there's a lot of, lot of waste that can, can be used as a feedstock. The cow populations by Great Plains State is listed um, in this table. There's a total of almost a million and a half dairy cows that are in the Great Plains. Um, looking at, on average, each cow produces the net equivalent of about 40 cubic feet of biogas. So if you take all the cows, the Great Plains could produce about 50 million cubic feet of biogas daily just based on the uh, manure, and that's equivalent to about 100 uh, gigawatts of electricity. And I just, um, I just saw Back to the Future the other day, so I know this could feed the, the flux capacitor and the DeLorean, so it's a, it's a good, source of, good source of energy. Um, how could we use that, the feedstock? So anaerobic digestion is one way we take um, organic substrate, decompose it, um, and the, the net production is, is biogas. Uh, it's a biochemical reaction. There's four stages. Um, it's, it's used already. Um, it's, a, it's a viable technology uh, and definitely something we should consider for producing gas. There's two temperature ranges for the, uh, for the bacteria in an AD facility. Um, 98 for um, mesophilic and 130 degrees for the thermophilic range. 
Again, we're, we're talking about the Great Plains, so we want to look at that temperature variability with that um, colder environments with the uh, less variation, it would be better to go with mesophilic because it's a, it's a lower temperature. Uh, here's a map of the um, anaerobic digestive systems already um, in the country, so you can see it's, they're, they're well established. Not too much in the Great Plains area, but more to the right, the upper, upper northeast has, a, has the most AD facilities. Another uh, feedstock to consider is algae. Again, we want to we want to show our due diligence to our senior leadership that we looked at all the variables. Um, algae can yield between 10,000 and 15 gallons of oil per acre. Um, it takes a lot of carbon dioxide to pr produce gas, so it's it usually takes more uh, CO2 than readily than is readily available in the environment. So that's one impediment. Um, and something to consider for, uh, for the business model. You know, how do we get the CO2, the extra CO2 that we need? Uh, woody biomass, the, um, this would be trees, forest residue, mill residue, construction waste. Um, there's a listing again of all the, the states within the Great Plains, um, how much woody biomass is accounted for and what, what we could use for renewable energy. So taking all the feedstock considerations, doing our due diligence, um, what's the conclusion for, for this feasibility study? So the conclusion for, for this particular one is that if we use wind power and dairy cow manure, since they're so prevalent and sustainable, in that Great Plains region, we can use them uh, and we can distribute those at low intensity to the different um, rural electric associations. The specific areas now, we have, to, we have like 10 states in the Great Plains, what are we going to narrow that down to? So again, taking this data, taking all those tables, um, the wind energy, the, the dairy cow um, population, how can we narrow it down further so we can make a more focused business case? So again, uh, from the tables, we're going to pick North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota, and that's going to be our focal point. So that's, that's our first feasibility study. So we've concluded that we're going to, we're going to narrow it down. We've got a three-state area. We've got a feedstock area. So now it's going to be how are we going to transform that feedstock and energy? How are we going to transform that into a sustainable energy? So the second study is going to be on how we're going to reach potential customers. How, how are we going to get that power out there? So REAs are Rural Electrification Associations. They're our ideal candidates um, since they're the ones that provide rural, residential, and industrial agriculture power. Um, and they also provide process fuels for local and export sales. Not going to go into too much of the history, but they've been around since the 1930s, and today there's real, uh, nearly 900 electrical co-ops that serve 40 million people in 47 states. So this is a this is a great target for the rural areas, specifically North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota. Um, this is a look at the North Dakota electrical cooperatives. Um, there's 15 distribution co-ops in North Dakota, but there's only four um, generation and transmission cooperatives. So again, we're, we're, we're starting to narrow that focus down. Um, another, so we have, we have the feedstock, we have our focus on our target, our customer. Now how are we going to get that energy over? So we have to look at the grid. The North American grid is the largest in the world. Um, just some, some facts, there's over 200,000 miles of transmission lines. Um, it's redundant, uh, power can be rerouted, um, and what I think is very important to, to this discussion and would be uncovered in the feasibility study, there's actually three separate 
grids within the, the global grid. So right down where our study is, we actually have to interface with three different grids. So that, again, that's going to be something that's very important because somebody's inevitably going to ask that question. We have to make sure we understand that. There's risk associated. How are we going to mitigate those risks? So we also have to look at um, the current situation of the grid. There's a lot of congestion. Um, you know, there's a lot of overburdening. If we're going to add to the burden on the grid, how's that going to affect that, those customers? Is this something that, that can even be handled? We're going to be putting a lot of energy and disperse it to customers, local customers. How's that affect the distribution lines? So doing some, some research uh, for, for the grid, is, which is our first venue into how we're going to uh, supply this energy, we're running into our first roadblock. Uh, we're seeing that the grid needs billions of dollars uh, of transmission upgrades. The Federal Energy Regulation Commission um, provides statistics that there's at least 9% of all power that's being generated is lost in transmission. So we would have to account for that in our production. That's going to eat into our business model. So this, this factor has to be considered and becomes very important in, in our model. So our second feasibility study, we're going to conclude that the overburdened grid precludes the addition of a sufficient quantity of electricity generated from the wind farms that could supply power to the east and west coast, replacing the fossil fuel plant. So that's an impediment. We can't, we can't use that. So it's also clear, though, that the distribution REAs are ideal candidate customers of an energy solution that will allow them to produce and provide power independently from the grid. So that's like really our second clue. So we have feedstock, we have power, we can't use the grid. How do we focus getting that power over to the customers without using the grid? So leads into our third feasibility study, which is economics. And I'm running a little short on time. So the economics, we're going to look at land use requirements. Um, we're going to do a life cycle analysis and assessment between wind and anaerobic digestion because they were our two focal points and see from an economic standpoint what's the better technology that would be more viable and uh, provide the most financial gain for, for a business model. So. We're going to follow the framework of ISO 2006 for our life cycle assessment. We're going to build um, a model, set our boundaries. We're going to focus on, for our anaerobic digestion and uh, wind farms, we're going to focus on the facility construction, operation and maintenance, um, the end of life, and the material extraction will not be a focal point on this assessment, but we'll, we'll keep the criteria similar so we have parameters and data um, that's equal uh, from the two different technologies. And it just shows we're, what we're doing the same for the wind farms. So how are we going to do that? So from a perspective of Google Maps and satellite images, we're going to look at wind farms that are existing, and we're going to break those areas down, and we're going to do our economic analysis by actually taking measurements of the surfaces that are becoming impermeable with the with the construction of the of the wind farms. With that analysis, we're going to come up with a land occupation value um, in hectares per milliwatt, and it's based on the total area, the um, installed capacity, and the capacity factor. And we're going to do that similarly for anaerobic digestion, and this is going to give us actual data values that we can present to senior leadership. We're going to have a, a benefit to cost ratio. Um, from the feasibility study, our benefit to cost ratio for the wind farms uh, came out to be consistently 2.15. Um, and depending on the, the capacity, the nameplate capacity of the wind farms, 
the wind farms are using between two and 129 hectares of permanently disturbed land. So that becomes important for our business model. We also do a sensitivity analysis to show, you know, we've looked at the different factors, uh, electricity price, interest rates, operation and maintenance costs, capital costs, what affects our, our ratio the most. Um, in, in this specific example, the um, price of electricity had the greatest impact on the benefit to cost ratio as it's kind of common sense in that area. Um, we do the same thing for now for anaerobic digestion. So we're going to look at the annual cost, um, amount of revenue that can be produced from the, from the dairy cows, the biogas. Um, we're going to come up with a cost to benefit, benefit to cost ratio for AD. It's uh, not as consistent as wind farms. It's between 1.2 and 1.25. And then we'll also do an analysis on the variabilities um, of AD. For AD, um, the two factors were sense of, um, milk revenue and uh, the annual farm cost. They had the most impact to, um, uh, to the sensitivity of the, of the ratio. Um, interest rates, conversely, interest rates and state incentives for the electricity had very small impact, which I thought was a little um, unusual when I did the analysis. But it was... It, again, it's something that's going to be asked, and we have to be prepared to answer those questions. So, again, I apologize for going through this a little bit fast for the third analysis, but the conclusion is more energy and more revenue can be generated per hectare of land using wind energy as opposed to AD. So that, that came from the analysis. We were able to prove that. But if we take into consideration the land use, land intensity and the project economics of our specific case, which is an integrated system, if we use both AD and wind energy together, we can address both the economical and environmental challenges using both as an integrated solution. So by studying the, the results of the feasibility analysis, we were able to determine we don't want to just cut out anaerobic digestion. If we combine them, the combined solution makes a lot more sense than having one separate solution based on one technology. So from there, we've done our feasibility studies, we've done our due diligence, now it's time to do a, a business model that we can present. The business model will show the financial viability um, and will assist with determining if the solution is something that will make sense for a sustainable future for the corporation as well as for our customers. Um, this typically is one of the most important aspects of the, of the presentation of senior leadership. So currently there's, there's 91 dairy farms throughout North Dakota. Um, because the dairy farm size Sizes really vary drastically. The business model was developed uh, and designed for flexibility, so you can plug in the number of, uh, of cows uh, in the dairy farm, um, and it, you can use it for any instance if it's a large farm, medium farm, or small farm. So the first step of our, of our business model was it determined the power requirements for the anaerobic digester that we're going to have to construct on the on the farm. Um, Going through all the, all the parts of the AD system, we came out that we're going to need about 2,600 megawatt hours per year of electricity. Second step is, okay, what size turbine do we need to accomplish that? So a 1.5 megawatt turbine, uh, name plate capacity, we can generate about 5,000 megawatt hours per year. So that's in tune with what we need. Step three What's our total capital cost? So if we use the cost for the AD system, the turbine, um, we came up with, we're going to need about $3.3 .3 million. If we go with subsidies, total cost would be about $1.5 million. 
what's our, what's our benefits? So electricity savings, we're looking at substantial savings, substantial revenue, the biogas production revenue over the course of the year, and carbon credits from uh, the AD system and, and wind energy, the total payback would be within five years, which turns out to be a very good investment. Um, that typically would help sell this to senior leadership with, with a small payback time period. So again, we take the model. The mo it's very important that the model is tailorable because when you're reaching out to different customers, you're going to have different uh, variabilities, different sizes. So you want to make the, the model um, variable enough that you could plug in uh, different variables and, and get the results that you need. It's very important to, to encompass all different aspects. After that, now it's ready to go to senior leadership. But right before you go to senior leadership, you have to know about your risks and, and mitigation. That's always going to come up. So the best thing to do before you go to the leadership is do a SWOT analysis, uh, strengths, weaknesses, threats and prepare for any questions that you know going to separate you from the competition. So what are the strengths of, of this new venture? So we have our corporate research and development, we have our skill sets, we have a diversified business, um, and we have integration of products and services. That's definitely our strengths. What's our opportunities? Um, we're increasing our demand to expand our portfolio, expansion of renewable energy portfolio, our go green political pressures would be abated. Um, definitely opportunities for the corporation. Weaknesses, we have this Department of Defense mentality, we have to overcome that. Um, large project focus, these are gonna be smaller projects. We have to go from multi-billion dollar projects to small million dollar projects. Um, Another weakness is we have expensive overhead, so we're going to have to restructure ourselves. Threats, there's always threats from competition, small mom, mom and pop, renewable energy, uh, companies that are rising up, and slowing growth of world economy. So we have to look at those uh, different areas, and we have to come up with uh, opportunities to present to our senior leadership how we're going to mitigate all the risk, how we're going to monopolize on our strengths, opportunities um, and how we're going to use that to our advantage. Now we're ready to go. So we're going to present to senior leadership. We're going to use our business model, our feasibility studies, our risks and mitigations, and we're going to do our presentation and ask for a new venture. So senior leadership is going to go through their gaining policy and they're going to decide, is this, does this have the potential to go forward and be a, be a new venture? So while the team is working, if the, we get the, green, the initial green light, a new venture white space um, area will be formed. The, the team focuses on the design uh, and focuses on going forward. Meanwhile, there's periodic meetings. It's very important for corporate leadership to stay involved. Um, they'll set a timeline where the expectations for um, production, profitability, going to market, that'll all be established. And it's very important that everybody remains on the same page and kept informed of what's going along the way. Um, there may be areas when you start doing the, uh, when the team's formed, you hit a, a roadblock and you determine we didn't think of this or this just was recently discovered and it makes sense not to go forward with the new venture. That saves the company maybe three years worth of wasted energy and profits that could be focused in other areas. But by having that group dynamic where you're having you know, outside um, eyes that are not myoptically focused uh, on the, the project, uh, you have different inputs and you can proceed and decide as a team whether you should keep going or not. So, in conclusion, 
this process provides a guide for entrepreneurship from both uh, corporations and engineers. Take an idea from conception to corporate senior leadership for approval so you can form a new venture. Um, as an example, we use the Integrated Renewable Energy Solution as, a, as an example to proceed and analyze. During the analysis, we went through the corporate gates to ensure that we maintain alignment with the corporation. We showed about the feasibility studies, um, and how important it is to do your due diligence and really look at all the different areas. Um, we studied the market analysis on the end customer, did a life cycle assessment on the land use and how that's going to impact renewable energy. All that information was used to create a business model. Uh, we determined the financial payback. And then we also did a risk mitigation using the SWOT analysis uh, to resolve uncertainty. And again, all this information is used to build a strong business case to present um, and anticipating the necessary uh, questions that are going to be received to get the approval to go forward. Thank you very much. Carl, yes, sir. I know you worked with uh, Dr. Martin on this. Was this done also in conjunction with uh, Johnson & Johnson? No, no, this was... This is an interesting yeah. study. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, just in time. Yeah. <laughs> I like to think you guys really stayed because of the presentation, but I think having the food at the end was a. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work out in the end, right? <laughs> Thank you. Do you intend on uh, uh, taking this any further? Could... Patent pending. Yep, have the application in for the, for the patent for the process, the utility patent. And then uh, perhaps a class in engineering management. You know, I, you know, I think about energy and I go back to. Uh, uh, maybe like 15 years ago, where there used to, especially on the West Coast, there used to be a lot of brownouts. And, and now you're, you're not seeing that anymore. And I heard that one of the reasons why is because, uh, uh, because of alternate sources of energy. Like, I, I'm seeing a lot of it now in my neighborhood. Mm. There, uh, a lot of houses are starting to get solar, solar panels. Yeah, sure. in. And in, in fact, uh, one of my neighbors has it, and he says that, he, he sometimes overproduces, and that feeds into the electrical grid. Right, right. And I understand that in California. I heard, I haven't been out there in a while, but a lot of houses have it out there. And perhaps that's the reason why there's not many brownouts anymore, because yeah. that's a possible solution. Right. And I guess as we venture forward, there's not going to be many more power plants, number one. Number two, it's not environmentally safe. And, I mean, is this, is this the way of the future? We're going to be seeing more and more... I'd like to think so. I think the way the, the structure of the grid, I think unless there's going to be an enormous amount of money towards infrastructure, um, we definitely have to go the way of renewable energy. It's just the, the grid is so overburdened that, um, to your point, you can't just build new power plants yeah. and, and load the grid any further. It just it won't take it. Yeah, and I, and I believe, you know, I'd, I'd like to see like a brand new development where it's sustained by just the solar and wind. Mm. And, and I think that that's feasible, but I don't know if that ever would be plausible where they would just uh, have that. I mean, you know, you, you'll see new development come up, and then on the houses, they'll, they'll, in, in the development, there'll be wind energy, and, and every house will have solar panels. I mean, maybe we'll see that in the foreseeable yeah. future. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> awesome. Great presentation. Oh. That was very enjoyable. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's a fun project. Yeah, it sounds like it. Thank you. And nice to know that. Oh, thank you. On that one, the manure from animals can produce the energy. It's a straight poop. Yeah.